Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get a copy of this program and other helpful documents. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Tim. Like Tim said, I'm Carrie McCoy, and it's time for me to get up in your business. For the next hour, my guest, successful artist and sculptor Kevin Cressy, and I will be getting up in the business of making art and money. About 30 years ago, Kevin and his wife Bridget made a decision to quit, and I'm going to quote Bridget here, their job jobs, and opt for a different road, a road full of passion and experiences without the accumulation of stuff. We hope through our storytelling of how we maneuvered the path of entrepreneurship in pursuit of our dreams that you will learn something, want to get involved, or be inspired to take action in your own life. And we'll be answering questions via phone and email. For me, it began over 40 years ago when I founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, Arkansas Flag and Banner has grown and morphed from door-to-door sales to telemarketing to mail order and catalog sales and now relies heavily on the internet. Each change in sales strategy required a change in company thinking and procedures. My confidence, leadership, knowledge, and my company grew. My initial $400 investment now produces nearly $4 million in annual sales. Each week on this show, you'll hear candid conversations between me and my guests about real-world experiences on a variety of businesses and topics that I hope you'll find interesting. Starting and running a business or organization is like so many things. It takes persistence, perseverance, and patience. I worked a part-time job for nine years before Arkansas Flag and Banner grew enough to support just me, and I worked with you, uh, Kevin, during those nine years. You were the bus boy and I was the waitress at Sirloin's Inn. <laughs> it's now grown so much that to operate efficiently, we require 10 departments and 25 people to maintain them, thus reminding us all again that small businesses are not only the fuel of our economic engine, but also impact and empower people's lives. Before we start, I want to introduce you to the people at the table. We have my technician, Tim, who will be running the board and taking your calls. Say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. My guest is renowned artist and sculptor Kevin Cressy, who's recently been in the news for his commissioned bust of the famous singer LaVon Helm, and who last year was in the news for his commissioned seven-foot-tall, 1,300-pound bronze statue of the famed U.S. Army Ranger and war hero General William O. Darby from Fort Smith, Arkansas. Kevin's work has been featured in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, the North Little Rock Times, the Little Rock Free Press, Active Years Magazine, Soiree Magazine, just to name a few. He's also been featured in pieces produced by the local affiliates of ABC, CBS, and PBS Television, as well as a short film by Garrett Larkin. Lakin. Mm -hmm. Lakin, is that how you say it? Yeah. Cressy, Cressy has been awarded painting fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, Mid-America Arts Alliance, and Arkansas Arts Council. He has also been the winner of several awards from the Arkansas Art Center's annual Delta competition. It is a pleasure to welcome to the table my friend, the talented and successful artist extraordinaire, Kevin Cressy. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm actually sick of myself now after the introduction. <laughs> I don't... I don't even want to hear from the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made a film about you? Uh, Garrett was a, a good buddy. He was uh, went to NYU Film School and ended up down here. He was, and uh, yeah, he did a little thing. But um, so where is it? In your li in your well, library like at so home? So many of my stories. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Garrett was a wonderful guy, but but unfortunately he passed away. Oh, in I'm sorry. And, and uh, so I saw the film and everything, and I think Waymac has the copy. Really? Yeah. Well, that's neat. I know. I need to get it. But anyway. Uh, at what age did you find out you had this gift for art? Because you really have a gift for art. Ah. Oh, um, you know, it was just one of those things I did. But what's interesting was when I, you know, I went through obviously with ten brothers and sisters. Then we went through the parochial school. So. Having graduated from Catholic High, you need was, to stop right there and tell everybody that you're Catholic and you have ten brothers and sisters. Okay, pick back up. There we go. And uh, so I didn't really have any art classes uh, until I got to college. So really, I had no idea if I was any good or not. I had nothing to compare myself to. But you said right before we came on that I've known you since you were fourteen. Right when I was bussing tables at sirloins, and I must have been twenty-one. 
so you were drawing then. I remember. Yeah, back but then. I was. Yeah, but you know, I was drawing on the back of, uh, um, you know, the pay stubs. But we were caricatures keeping them. of everybody. Yes. Yeah, I know. I think some people are still have blackmail material on me from those days. Um, so, so can you not not create? I mean, could you ever just go? I'm not going to do this anymore, or is it just like an obsession? You have to doodle and draw and create all I don't ever see you doodle actually but you have to just no, but I think everybody has that in them no I don't I do no I, th I think maybe it gets taught out of us in school or something but um, if we let it but I know I think everybody has a need to do something whether it be you know garden or uh, you know, music or I, mean, I think everybody has something in them it's just about getting it to come out so you and your wife Tell the story. You made a deliberate decision, as Bridget says, to quit your job jobs and stop the vicious circle of working for money and accumulation. Yeah. Well, in college, this there was zero was ever said about how to make a living as an artist. And so really, the only two options I ever saw were uh, you become an art teacher and teach other people how to not make a living in art uh, <laughs> or you would go into advertising and, and those are the only two options I that I remember thinking about so uh, I went into advertising and at that point the Democrat had brought everything from ad agencies in-house and so I was hired by uh, Estelle Jeffrey who was he, he had just been hired so we just started kind of started from scratch doing this and doing so what? doing all the advertising for the paper. So I was doing at 23, I was doing TV commercials and billboards and pops on the river posters and writing radio spots and a lot of stuff I had no business doing because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but it was great. It, it fast forwarded my life to see what I would be doing in advertising at, you know, 40 or so when you would become an art director. So. I did that for a few years, and then Bridget was doing stocks and securities uh, <laughs> with her mom, which just kind of cracks me up to think about now. But um, yeah, anyway, it was great because we both kind of got, like I said, fast forwarded to seeing what grownups would be doing, and it just wasn't doing it for us. So when, how did the conversation come about? We're going to quit our jobs and we're going to become artists because isn't Bridget an artist also? No, she, she's a, she has a wonderful eye. She's a good photographer and she has got great taste and, um, like spinal tap, you know, she's brutally frank with me about mm -hmm. what I do, which is great. You need someone as opposed to, Oh, that's so nice. You know, mm -hmm. you need, you know, and, and she definitely, uh, does that part for me. So, um, yeah, I don't, you know, it was just a, one of those things. I don't think it quite clocks you over the head. It's sort of a gradual thing. And then I remember going, walking in Destel's office and giving him a one year notice. One year? Yeah. Cause I needed money to, to save up. Because for we, what? We backpacked around Europe for about three and a half months. That's what you did when you quit your jobs? Yes. And <clears throat> I've said this before, but it took me about two weeks. And this is the thing I noticed about the American system of getting well first you had to work for a year before you even got vacation so then the next year you would get a week and uh i noticed on that three and a half month trip it took me about two weeks to stop the you know the phantom pains of, oh did i take care of this at work did i tell the guy who took my place this you know those things that would just fire off occasionally mm -hmm. until that finally kind of died off and then i also realized before that, I had been sort of identifying who I was by what was written on my business card. So when I would meet people, I was, you know, like I said, there I was in my mid twenties. So I was I, like, oh, I'm Kevin Chris, I'm art director, you know, you know, in a deeper voice, and and, <laughs> um, and so gr backpacking around was great because then it just everything it was like being dead and looking back at your life with this great objectivity, and then I was. Uh, then I did have a clock on the head because it, everything had been set in place. So I remember definitely, you know, when we were in Florence and um, overlooking in Italy and overlooking the Duomo, and and then I was like, I do not want to go back to that job, you know, or any job in advertising. I want to be an artist. So you hadn't quit your job yet? 
no, I had quit. But I also, it, one of the subliminal things I, I realized later was I, I didn't take access, I didn't use any of the facilities at the paper to put together a portfolio to go look for a job when I got home. Oh, it was subliminal. Mm -hmm. So you and Bridget said, let's just go back and have a very minimal life and start trying to make a living as an artist? Yeah. And, and that, it was interesting. I remember the first day, too, you know, getting a canvas and looking at it and going, whoa, what do I do? Because, you know, before it was like, okay, we need you to come up with something. Here are your parameters. And that was the Arkansas Democrat. Something. Yeah. Anything in advertising. You know, these, here's your parameters. This is what we need something on. Now go create. And then all of a sudden, here was a, a blank canvas. And it was like, well, who are you? And what do you want to talk about on this canvas? And what do you want to? What was the first thing you painted? Do you remember? Mm, I think it was something about the trip. You know, I, I did a bunch of work kind of reflecting on the trip and what that was like. and Architectural work? Like of the buildings? No, 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 no. Internal stuff. Sort of like visual diaries of this change that was going on between. What does that mean? It means, well, um, okay, for example, I did... I, I did uh, I did, I did one painting called Leap of Faith, and it was sort of a self-portrait, but it was disjointed. So on one canvas, a small canvas, I had painted my face, sort of this screaming thing. And then from you see the back of me sort of falling in space. And then another canvas, there's maybe just a focus on the foot. So it's a disjointed self-portrait. And then you see the uh, building sort of being ripped in half in the background, and I'm sort of floating up. And it's just this... Was it cathartic doing all that? Oh, yeah, you bet. That. So who bought your first painting? You better remember this. Can send them a Christmas card every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I start going, well, you know, especially with a big family, you, I think, you know, you get all the help uh, from, oh, from your brother and yeah, your yeah, mother yeah. about so your I, that's first why, painting. That's why I was sitting there hesitating because I was trying to think, well, who was the first one who didn't count as, oh, poor Kevin, he's trying to make, <laughs> he's trying to make it as, a, as an artist. We need to buy something from mm -hmm. him. Um, uh, it, it, it'll hit me. I'm blanking now, but, um, it was, I mean, well, Charlotte in, in college gave me my first show at her Charlotte hit. Uh, -uh. Mm -hmm. um, I hope she's listening. At, I just thought of that. And when I was in college, let me put up paintings in her shop. Um, and then I had my first show after I did that. Uh, my good friend, Willie Allen, Willie and Sally Allen opened their home for me. My uh, mom and sisters uh, did all the food, and um, we made up invitations. And Where was that show? In their home, up on uh, Edgewood. In Little Rock? In Little Rock, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then, did you sell much? No, sold nothing. Uh, <laughs> uh, then I had my first show at the Baker Gallery, which is in Chroma Gallery. Yeah, in Hillcrest? Yeah. Uh, Hill, yeah. Chroma Gallery. No, that's, no, in, in, that's, Heights. A, that's in, in the Heights, Heights. yeah. Um, and I, <laughs> did you sell anything? No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's keep going. <laughs> then I had a show. Those uh, people missed it. They should have got somewhere. You were cheap. <laughs> oh, this is getting depressing now that I'm thinking about it. No, <laughs> then I had a show at Taylor's Contemporary Gallery of Help. Um, it was interesting because I was at uh, Baker's and it switched over to Chroma. So actually I had Chroma's very first show. And then I had uh, Carolyn Taylor's first show in Hot Springs. Did you sell anything? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this guy keep going? Can't he take a hint? God, go home. Uh, <laughs> so what's the next uh, one? <laughs> Do we want to know? <laughs> okay. Actually, now there was, um, <laughs> after the Taylor show had closed, they, she kept a couple pieces. And then later, one of those sold Hallelujah. to a, a guy from New York who was a set designer Smart and, was, and was down in Hot Springs. Okay. We've got to take a break because we got to go laugh. <laughs> Uh, when we come back, Kevin will tell us how the bust of Levon Helms came to be, hear the story of the bronze statue he made for the war hero, General William O. Darby of the Darby Rangers from Fort Smith, Arkansas. I know Kevin used to teach, we'll find out if he still does, and get tips for pursuing a career in art. And if you miss any part of the show, a podcast will be made available next week on flagandbanner.com's website or on iTunes, I think. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. We'll be right back. Baby. 
Yeah, yeah you're humming, aren't you? No. Up on, yeah. You don't want to hear me sing, though. But Oh, you can. No. Uh, so that was really fun. I went on YouTube and saw this Lee Von Helm song. And man, it was live. And it was so good. If you want, if anybody wants to go see it on YouTube, it was really great. Kevin, tell us about Lee Von Helm. Who he was, how you, an Arkansas artist, came to be asked to create this bust. First off, Lee Von is just the coolest. I, uh, and if, even if you're not interested in Lee Von, you ought to read his book, This Wheel's on Fire. What? Yes, it's what a it? wonderful This Wheel's read. on Fire. This Wheel's on Fire. And it's... He must have just been on the porch with a beer and dictating it because it just reads so conversationally. I mean, it's it's just it's just the coolest book. It's great. But did he do it after he was done? No, it came out in like '92, uh, I think. Oh, something a long like time that. ago. Yeah. But um, anyway, so oh yeah, so how did it come about? Well, um, all right, my old roommate Chris Maxwell from the Gun Bunnies uh, in the days when I was. Living with him now. Chris has uh, moved to New York in the mid '90s, and now he lives in Woodstock, which is where Levon lived. And of course, they've renamed um, part of the Arkansas Highway. You know, it's part of Levon Hill Memorial Highway, and there's also a Levon Hill Memorial Highway in Woodstock as well. So they did it in Arkansas because he was born in Marvel, Arkansas. Yeah, Turkey Stretch. He was born Turkey Stretch yeah, in a lane, or, or no? Or, anyway. But anyway, grew up in Turkey Scratch. Yeah, a Turkey suburb. Scratch. Okay. Turkey Scratch. Yes, a suburb of Marvel. Of Marvel. <laughs> so there you go. But uh, anyway, Chris was in town, and then uh, also uh, musician extraordinaire Greg Spradlin uh, was doing a video and having uh, of Chris playing a song. So the three of us were running around, and uh, Greg was had done the video for the Levon Hill Memorial. Oh. And so he was talking about that. And I was sort of going with Greg, hey, don't don't forget your old bad <laughs> Kevin over here. Because actually they I think they had already contacted an artist out in Vegas. So they were already thinking about doing a bust. Well they're actually they were going to be doing a large uh relief, a bronze relief. And um it was gonna cost bukus of money. Yeah. So anyway I had um Greg managed to get me a meeting with the um, Anna Lee and Joe Griffith and some of the ones who are starting. Friends uh, of Levon or yes. something? Mm -hmm. Anna Lee's in the song, The Wait. Um, anyway, so. Um, Is that his wife? No, childhood friend from Turkey Scratch. Mm. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, I went down to Doe's and had a meeting with them. In Little Rock, Arkansas? Mm hmm. Okay, so you didn't have to go to Woodstock? No, got to go to the power room at Dozo. That was uh -huh. fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that room. <laughs> uh, anyway, made my pitch and got the got the job. And so the bust is going to be for Mar Marville, Arkansas. That's where it's going to be. Yes. Now they're they're also part of this. You know, they're raising money and they're to uh, restore his childhood home as well. See, in, so in, in Arkansas, it'll too? be in Marvel. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and that's another thing. They, they yeah, they they had brought actually. Richard Butler here in Little Rock had yeah. gotten several houses from there, and then they got up and realized that one of them was Levon's, and then Richard donated Levon's house back to them. So it's moved back down to Marvel. And um, so anyway, that's part of the project is to restore the home, and then the bust will be outside the home. So they you've they've paid you to make the bust out of clay. That's what you do, right? And then you have to fire. Then you tell, tell us the process. So, yes, the first thing is me doing the sculpture, and then, uh, yeah, then a mold will be made, then they'll do the, then the foundry takes over. They make the mold, they pour, the, do the wax, and, um, you know, pour the bronze, the whole bit from there. Did you have to work from a photograph, or what did you work from? Yeah, a lot of photographs. Well, that, I mean, that was a whole other thing as well. Because he know, was gone. Yeah, well, the first meeting, it was like, well, we'd like a bust of Levon, so I did a sketch of traditional bust and brought it to him for the second meeting and then joe was like man it'd be cool if he was holding some drumsticks and a mandolin and and i said well that would be cool you know it's another sculpture but it would be cool so did that and then came back to the third meeting at the third meeting paul berry was there who's an old 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 friend of uh levon's and he was like man he's got to be singing you know and I, I, all i could think of was i thought well i've never seen a singing bust and well, there's a first there's for everything. a first for everything i was i um, mean not to be you know i was a little worried that it was going to kind of come off looking 
like uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail with the Black Knight when he gets his arms and legs cut, cut off and the you know and I was, I was like oh no this singing so anyway I thought well if we get the microphone in there that gives it context on why because Levon's such an expressive singer gosh he is and um so anyway yeah worked off um photos and then just watched hours and hours and hours of uh, the last waltz because then I could see different angles and really see him pushing it out there singing and that's when just watching him over and over i was just flabbergasted the way he, the physicality of the way he would drum and then have all that being able to push out that volume and that wonderful voice and that, it's just amazing he is amazing and i had yeah. no idea till i watched these youtube videos but you nailed it it's just so physical oh yeah and then to be able to hear everything i mean just yeah to do the whole thing uh, and i'm I'm in awe of what he did. So a lot of people were excited about you doing that, and you got a lot of press. Who came to interview you over the over the? Well, Anna Lee and actually, and I, Anna Lee and I went out and kind of did the little dog and pony show as far as uh, the local, all the media and everything, and then um, we went to the AP uh, Associated Press here, and he, uh, big fan. And then the next morning, then Bridget was like, "Good Lord, you know, it was it had been picked up." all over so you got phone calls nationally about it yeah well i got uh, some interviews from some upstate new york papers who were obviously interested because of levon living up in woodstock area and um but the, yeah but the story was picked up by the new york times and the uh, washington post and when did you decide that so the so leave uh the friends of levon don't have enough money to turn it into a bronze because that's expensive right so and woodstock doesn't want to help with that well, Woodstock has here. its own thing going on. I mean, they're trying to save the barn that Levon had and everything. But I, I, I um, have talked to them as well. And his daughter, Levon's daughter, Amy, is a singer-songwriter. And she's played here. In fact, she just played here maybe a week or two ago up in Fayetteville, Georgia's. Oh, neat. Yeah. And um, so she came last year and did a show at South on Main here in Little Rock. And so she came by the house to see the bust. And of course, that's always scary because the family, you know, and, and you're like, uh, but she loved it. It was one little change minor that I made while she was there. And then she said, perfect. That's it. And the other cool thing is that she's got a couple boys and they were upstairs playing with my kids. And um, the one, he was about 10 years old. Uh, his name's Lee. He came down and he hadn't seen it yet. He just came down and looked up and went, Pappy. Oh, and that went, is good. Yeah. Then I went, okay, that's it. You we, nailed it. We, we got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how old was a young boy? Uh, around ten. That's good. Um, you got the GoFundMe account. Mm -hmm. Let's plug it. You need some money to get this bronze. Yeah. How much money do you need? Uh, I haven't heard lately, um, but um, I mean it's an ongoing process because, like I said, they're not going to stop at the bust. You're going to keep going with the house and everything. I think they're so. The GoFundMe is not just for the bust; it's for the whole project. It's like phase for one, right? You know, I mean, they're going to. I think the total goals are like 150 thousand to try to get things. So where do you go to this shorter. GoFundMe? Um, yeah, go GoFundMe.com, and then you can. Plug in Leave on, leave on Helm. Helm and you'll get there. Right. And you there's also leaveonhelmmemorial.org, uh, which is an, the website that you can also donate through there as well. So they're not the same as Woodstock. So if you fund that, does it go to both Woodstock and Marvel? Uh, no, to Marvel. It all goes to Marvel. Mm -hmm. Did they not have a GoFundMe up there? They're not smart enough to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like I said, I was... I think their focus right now is on the barn. Did they ever get contract anybody to do the big, the big statue that you were talking about? The relief, the big relief. No, because that was for the Marvel. And then when I once I talked to them, I, oh, that was for I Marvel. was saying I, I wouldn't do a relief. Oh, I thought that was for Woodstock. No. All right, it's another time for us to take a quick break. Um, when we come back, we'll have Kevin tell us the story of the bronze statue he made for the war hero General O. General William O. Darby of the Darby Rangers from Fort Smith, Arkansas. We'll find out what his favorite medium is right now, why, and what keeps him motivated and creating. I know Kevin used to teach. Is he still? And if you miss any part of the show, no worries. A podcast will be made available next week at flagandbanner.com's website, or you can go to, uh, what's that, iTunes? Yeah, iTunes. We're, we're on iTunes. iTunes and Blog Talk.
Oh, we're on both. That's right. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. My guest today is Little Rock, Arkansas, renowned artist and sculptor Kevin Cressy. Oh, um, yeah, at the break, we were talking about this song. <laughs> tell, them that, tell them about your what? bust is made from this song. Yeah, well, I, I had, um, because as the bus kept changing, you know, as I was working on it, then, yeah, it was interesting. I had a, a certain mouth position. I thought, eh, it just didn't feel right. And so this, you know, the sculpture is basically between the N and the I of night. On oh, night. Night. That night. night. Oh, and, wow, that's um, crazy. Um, but, yeah, Levon, I mean, he, so I was saying, you know, he had a complete acting career as well. So he played Loretta Lynn's uh, dad and Coal Miner's daughter. He was in The Right Stuff. Uh, in fact, he did the voiceover at the end of The Right Stuff. Um, he was in The Shooter with Mark Wahlberg. I think that was one of the latter ones. Really? Um, he, oh, I can't remember the name of, of Tommy Lee Jones. In fact, Tommy Lee Jones is the one who got him, I think, going when uh, they were looking for Loretta Lynn's father. I think Tommy Lee Jones was the one who suggested him. But anyway... Um, it's called the three burials of mosquitoes. I don't know. It's a Spanish name, I can't, but, uh, he's phenomenal on that. So, uh, also Tim, you did a live update while we got on your phone and went to the, where'd you go to the GoFundMe? Directly to the GoFundMe. That's and right. And how much was the goal? The goal is 25 K. And they have how much, how much have they? Almost at 11 K. Almost at a half. We're getting there. The little engine that could. So chug it, chug it. Yeah. I like it. Um, so let's talk about the the uh, the General William Darby, one thousand three hundred pound, <laughs> seven foot tall statue in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Which I hoisted up with me own bare hands. <laughs> yeah, that was a biggie. Well, okay, this is what I love about what I get to do because I get into the worlds of these different people, you know. So to go from General Darby, who started the U.S. Rangers. Um, and you know to leave on him so it's that's what i love about what i get to do for one thing but um uh william darby yeah grew he, up in fort smith and um who commissioned you well once again it was kind of a grassroots thing uh joe and liz armstrong who are uh joe was a ranger and both of them grew up in fort smith and do you know them before no i did not know them before um how'd they find you it, it was a, a national competition thing Oh, so you, it was a national competition. Yeah, a lot of times you're throwing your hat in the ring, you know, for, for jobs, for especially big ones. And you like submitted that. a drawing? Uh, I think, you know, you, I'm trying to remember. I think that one I submitted my portfolio. Some of them are, are you know, they request a specific uh, drawing or whatever. And others, they would just want to see your portfolio to see that you've done work and you're capable of doing it. So, anyway. Do you have to go in for interviews? And oh, yeah. Because I think what I think what it was was we put the portfolios in and I made the final cut of three maybe artists and then they asked for a drawing and then go in for an interview to to the board and you pitch your idea and your, you sell yourself basically. So being a successful artist is like applying for a job over and over and over, over, and, over, over. and over again. Gosh, what have, have you done for never, me lately? I, I would have never thought that. Mm -hmm. So how do you find these listings? Do they have mm. like a website that you go to? Yeah, they post? you know, I mean, that's the nice thing about the internet now is that you, you do some of that. But um, but for for that one, I think Mark Christ uh, at the Arkansas Historical. Yes, kind of. I ran into him when I was out on a walk, and he told me that that was coming up, and so I put it on my radar. So it's networking. Oh, that helps so much. Yeah. You so you fell in love. I followed you on Facebook, mm -hmm. and I watched the motorcycles that. Yeah, Amen. that was astounding when they brought it all in. You were speechless. You were you were you you were you were in awe. It of was it. emotional. There was a guy that we met. Uh, the unveiling was on Saturday morning. Uh, Friday night they had kind of a meet and greet, and I got to meet uh, Darby's nephew that I've been talking with quite a bit through email, but we hadn't met in person, and that was quite a, an emotional meeting. And then there were Wilbur. His nickname, Punch, Wilbur Punch Gallup. He's 95 years old, in a wheelchair, had been one of Darby's original 500 men, and he was there. And Is he the last living survivor? I, boy, I mean, I don't know. My, pro, very probably. So but what did he say? 
Well, he was so soft-spoken, and half of his face was kind of disfigured because he had taken shrapnel and shells in, during the war. And he had, I think, every medal you could even think of, and some I'd never heard of. He'd been awarded. So anyway, interesting character, and I was so glad my boys were with me. You know, get to meet him and take some pictures with him and everything. Oh, oh. They're coming for me. They're coming for you. Um, but anyway, real soft-spoken, sweet guy. And, oh, he was nicknamed Punch because he was the 1940 Golden Gloves champion of the Midwest, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, then at the unveiling, uh, all these rangers were lined up behind Punch in his wheelchair. And then Punch all called him to attention with his loud, booming voice. This soft-spoken man in the wheelchair. And then just, just loud as you can imagine. And, boy, they all, oh. And, and so it was very, yeah, it was the hair, you know, on the back of your neck. So it's kind of, it was wonderful. So the, the nephew is Darby Watkins, and he said this about you. Thank you, Kevin Cressy, for absolutely nailing his uncle's image and personality. And he went on to say, when I look at that statue, I see a precocious boy with a wicked grin and a lust for life. Mm -hmm. So you didn't make a statue. So this bronze is not of him as a ranger. It's him as a young boy? No, it's of him as a ranger. You know, he's just saying you see that. In, that and that's what's... Um, once again, so interesting about getting to do what I do. You know, I mean, I read, uh, read a book that Darby had written about his growing up. Like, j there's just certain things that you, then you, you catch. And one of them that really caught my eye was uh, as a boy, he went down one of those drainage, big drainage ditches for like over a mile to went out to the river. And I remember having... On purpose? Yes. Can you... I mean, <laughs> I mean, growing up, we had a little one that went over the driveway, and I was afraid to go through it. So, I mean, I'm just talking, that's just any, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, reading a bunch of the books on him, too, he, he was um, an amazing character. Killed two days before the war ended. Really? In Europe, yeah, in Italy. So, he was born in Fort Smith in 1911. Mm -hmm. Graduated U.S. Military Academy of West Point, New York. Yeah, about mid-class. Mm -hmm. uh, he formed, during World War II, he formed the Darby's Rangers. Yeah. Yeah. They're, in fact, they, the U.S. Rangers were called Darby's Rangers for a long time. And there were no Rangers before him? No. It was like the first, almost like special ops kind of a group. And I think they were kind of basing it off the British commandos that, they, that were happening then. They went to northern Scotland to be trained. And... Uh, he did the, all of that and then started in North Africa. I can't believe how much research has to be done on your sculptures. No wonder you're so good at it because it's almost like uh, getting into the character of a role you're going to play. It, that's, I was about to say, yeah, it's, it's so much like that. Because what has to happen is, especially someone who's been, like with Darby, you know, they've been gone for whatever, 70 years. You have to just read about him, try to get into the character of who he is, and then yeah, it is like that. It's like I'm the actor who's playing him, and I have to um, know, f figure out as much as I can about him so that I, as I'm making choices, as I'm sculpting, I'm going, does this feel right more than anything? Does what? it feel like him? So it's not just about skill, it's intuitiveness. Too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You always, I, I always have to think, what's the emotional goal of what I'm doing? You know, where, where am I wanting this to go emotionally? And then you're putting the likeness and the, especially with, <laughs> with Darby, you having to get all the military stuff, right? Because those guys, man, and at one point I'm sending pictures to them all, you know, checking things. And, and at one point I had one rank on his collar and one rank <laughs> on his cap. And uh, they're like, Oh, Kevin, uh, you got two different, cause I'm not, yeah, I'm not a military. <laughs> and I was like, I've just seen you guys are checking making sure you're on your toes. Yeah. You know. uh, so yeah, you're just layering all that on. Do you get in that personality? Does it kind of affect your home life and who you are while you're sculpting a certain personality type? Yeah, I was ordering Bridget and the kids around for months. Whatever. Just like, were you yeah. singing? <laughs> were you singing when you were doing Levon? <laughs> Bridget, oh, Bridget has like perfect pitch, so she can't stand to see when she, it's like fingernails down the blackboard when I sing. So you're right. He did get a lot of medals. He had three Purple Hearts. Two Distinguished Service Crosses, Silver Star, Legion of Merit. He got something from the Russians. He got something from the French. And and then he was finally killed two days before the war was over. Yeah. Oh, you, I mean, you read the books, and he should have been killed a thousand times over. And then... Um, I mean, three Purple Hearts, that's a pretty big deal. That yeah, means no, something happened to you three 
it's astound- the, the things he did were incredible. And then uh, he was sent home for not quite a year in 44 and then went back to, to his to his men. He, he didn't uh, want to be away from something. Fort Smith is a sister city with Cisterna, Italy, and they suffered a huge defeat there. And um, uh, anyway, he wanted to get back to those men. He hated that that had happened. And um, anyway, he was uh, just in a group meeting of what they were, the Germans were retreating, obviously, and they fired a big shell and it exploded up above them and killed two of them, I believe. Wow. So you said in a publication, um, it's a kick knowing that my public work will still be there long after I'm gone. I never thought about that aspect too much until after my father died. It is also great hearing people interpret what they see in some of my work. It makes me realize that everyone sees art through their filter of life and that every interpretation is just as valid as the reason I did it. Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, the, my first public <clears throat> sculpture was uh, Baptist Hospital. And uh, P. Allen Smith was redoing the garden and he brought me on to do, it's like a good Samaritan scene. So anyway, when it was, uh, when we had installed it and I was doing some finishing work, that's when I first realized, because you would get these people coming up uh, and they would say, do you do this? And I was like, well, yes, sir. And he'd go, um, he, he'd go, now is that supposed to be the hospital and that the patient? And I go, yeah. I never, you know, and then it, it kept happening over and over again. Another one would come up and is that, now is that supposed to be God and that Job? Sure, you bet. That's right. exactly, you know. Is that Jesus and that us? Sure, you bet. Wow. Yeah, I, I never, you know, it was just right in my face. The first time that I was really, mm-hmm. I thought, this is great. This is great. So what do you think about all the Confederate statues being taken down? After all, aren't they just art also? I think you probably can't get away from, I think you have history, but then you have the history of the history of the way they were brought in during the time they were brought in for the the thinly veiled reasons that they were brought in. And I think that's what makes it for me so troubling, you know, because I didn't realize that growing up. I think a lot of this stuff is it just kind of becomes a wallpaper you don't notice anymore when you're sort of growing up around it. And then all this attention you know, is, is brought on it and you're going, oh, wow, I hadn't really thought about that. I hadn't really looked at it because you've been driving past it every day all your life or something. So what are most of those sculptures made out of? I think a lot of those would probably bronze as well. So would you... So. The sculptures are going to be taken down. Were there were there ever any famous artists that did any of them? You think? Mm, I, nothing that pops to my mind right off the bat. Yeah, I can't think of anything either. I heard someone say something about them being art, and I thought I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. No? Well, and it's interesting too because somebody was talking about the uh, here in Little Rock and at the, on the Capitol grounds, and and it's the one of. Um, it's actually of, of, a, of a soldier walking all, you know, he's uh, holding hands with his mother and there's a little kid uh, at the mother's side. You know, know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. If you're looking at the Capitol, sort of to the left. It's up on a pretty high pedestal. And uh, somebody's talking about that being a confederate, because it's not as blatantly obvious as, uh, you know, Stonewall Jackson or Robert Lee or whatever. And uh, because I always looked at it and just thought, oh, it's just a memorial to families being torn apart by war. So, right. Uh, I don't think it's as egregious as some of the other ones. Um, It's another time to take a break. When we come back, we'll find out if Kevin is still teaching and see if he has any tips for others who want to pursue a career in art. And if you miss any part of this show, a podcast will be available next week at flagandbanner.com, and we're on iTunes. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. We'll be right back. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. My guest today is Little Rock, Arkansas artist and sculptor, Kevin Cressy. So, Kevin, which one do you like? Wait, before we go on uh-huh. to talk about your craft. My craft. Let's, you told her, you told us another story at the break. I, I'm, see, I'm, I'm telling the best stories in between. In between. Okay. <laughs> tell that one, because you do all this research on the people. So tell the uh, other Lee Von Helm story. Well, no, it's just uh, talking to his friends. I mean, everybody who knew him has, has a Lee Von story. I mean, he's just one of those uh, uh, charismatic, uh, personable characters. And uh, I just, I've, I've heard so many different stories. But like I was saying, they, you know, they'd say, oh man, he, he's the kind, he would, he'd need 500 bucks, he'd take 500 bucks and you would never see it again. But then he'd 
have ten thousand dollars and give it away you know it was it just didn't seem to matter that much and to you him. Said it was he, more about the experience i think that he was in at the moment and you said he heard about a, yeah paul berry was telling me a story about um this boy who had i think died of can't i'm gonna get the story right but died of cancer or something here in arkansas and he was up in uh, new york and drove all the way down got a buddy of his they went and got a couple of harmonicas and worked out i think amazing grace went to the funeral to the graveside service and played and put their harmonicas on the coffin and he walked off yeah. That's a great story. So we were also at the break. Tim is just over there on his phone, Googling everything. And so you uh, pulled up the sculpture of Levon. Well, the picture's on the GoFundMe page. I'm just like refreshing it to see if we've been getting donations. But and as you scroll through, you can see the picture of the sculpture itself. And you, when you brought up that it's like at the, the nah, <laughs> like during night, right. old, like you could see it. Like that's literally what... Mm -hmm. it, the sound that's coming out of his mouth, you know? Right there. Yeah, that's great. So you taught, uh, well, let me ask yeah, you. Yeah, I taught for about. Yeah. Yeah. You taught the Arkansas Art Center. Mm -hmm. Did you teach sculpt or painting? I taught, I think, every, everything. Uh, early on, I think I, I, I taught kids cartooning. I, I taught, uh, anyway, drawing, figure drawing, figure painting, and figure sculpture. Also taught eight years at a head injury rehab center, taught kids. Really? Mm-hmm. That Which one do you like better? Paint you when I when, was in, buying your stuff because I have a self portrait of you that I yeah, bought. The probably scary 20, one, the yeah, the scary one. The scary one that I well, put. They're the all top. scary, but the, yeah, the extra one. special scary. One. That one's really secret, good. The secret sauce on it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you were painting everything then. Yeah. I went to a show and it was all paintings, and right. now it sounds like you're sculpting everything. What's, yeah. What's happened? Well, what what happened is um, I was teaching at the art center and you could take other classes so i just started jumping into sculpture because i had one sculpture class in college my very final semester and i liked it but then i was off on to other things so i thought yeah i'd like to get back into that so i started um sculpting at uh, at the night class and uh, my friend hamid a uh, super sweet guy he uh, moved and so i became then the sculpture teacher by default and at the arkansas art at center. the art center yeah and then got frustrated with the clays um, after they were fired, like fingers breaking off and everything. So went out to Euler and Michael Wark taught me how to cast. And um, But you still start with clay, don't you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, well, why, did they not, just why did the fingers not break off? Oh, so you went and learned, you lo learned, you went how, and learned how to cast how to, bronze. I got, you, oh, but when you fire it, doesn't it still have the tendency to break off or did you just end up having a teacher teach you how to keep it from being so fragile no the clays i mean the clays are different yeah i mean after they're fired the anything sticking off it can easily get it can still be broken so the clays that you were doing at the art center were different from the clays that you would do for a bronze yes if i know i'm going to do a bronze then i, I work in a different clay i work in an oil-based clay it doesn't dry out it's not as fragile uh no i finally get it and I'll do like large ones, like Darby. See, it, it's uh, it's over foam. It's what, a, it's a long process. Anyway, what does that mean? It's over foam. Well, the, I do a small model. Oh, and carve it they, out of foam. And they enlarge it in foam, and then spray the oil-based clay over it, and then I get the oil-based clay and articulate, and then I sculpt oh. all the details and everything, and make changes in the foam, and then sculpt in the. Because there's no clay. way you can make a clay seven feet tall. Right. That would be time consuming. It'd be crazy. It seems like it'd <laughs> yeah. fall over. So you make yeah. it out of foam mm -hmm. and then you put the clay on top of the foam and then you're able to sculpt that. So you just kind of got a base that you can kind of work right. off. That's of. kind of the armature right underneath. And, but I mean, getting it to the foundry, because I, I typically the large ones I take to Norman, Oklahoma is an art foundry there. So I took Darby in a U-Haul. I rented a 10 foot U-Haul truck and he's all in pieces. So the, the, <laughs> I had his bust of him in the passenger seat, so he looked like we were driving together. He's looking ahead, and we're, we're driving off, and I was about 15 minutes from the foundry, and I heard that there was a huge this explosion, and the drive shaft had broken, and uh, I was left on the side of the road. And anyway, adventure, art adventures, you know. And you don't worry, and I, it, it seems like it would break on the way there. Well, it, it, the big danger is when it's super hot because the clay can melt down to a liquid. So you don't want to be transporting it when it's super hot outside. 
So you believe in taking classes because you went to a class to learn how to do bronzes. So you're a big proponent if you want to be an artist to keep taking classes and. Yeah, I mean it's uh, depending on what you're. Yeah. Continuing you're your education. You in bet. Art. Well, uh, yeah. Did you're, you go to school for art? Is it college? Did I? Uh huh. I done went to school. To, I, I, I didn't I find it anywhere where you. No, when like I said, when I when I graduated high school, uh, I had five brothers and sisters already in college or med school. And I didn't know if I was any good or not. So, yeah, I, I went on out to, to, to ULR. University of Arkansas, Little Rock? Mm-hmm. And did you graduate? I did graduate. I, you know, I couldn't find that anywhere about you. I wondered if you ended up just going out of high school and becoming successful or if you actually went to school and yeah. stayed the whole time and got a degree. I got a degree. And you recommend yeah. that? Um, maybe not, depending on what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, as an artist, uh, if I were talking to myself back yes. then, I... would maybe go apprentice with an artist if I really knew what I was wanting to do. Um, I think a lot there's of there's that's a, it's a long, it's a big subject there. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's people ask me where I study and really I say I studied in my studio. Where is your, is you, do, well, do you do the, all of this I, I in had, your for house? 16 years I had a studio above Vino's and, and I, that's really where I learned my Till you burned it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody that story. <laughs> no, no, it's all it's all good now. It's all good, but uh, but I was going to say, coming up, uh, in fact, here in just a couple of weeks, we're starting the third installment of Artist Inc. Inc. Inc., which is an eight-week program teaching artists, uh, and we have all disciplines. So we had. I remember my last time I had a filmmaker, I had a writer. I had a fabric artist did a, um, teaching how to make a living in the arts. Because like I said, nothing was ever said to me about how to make a living. So when is this? Uh, it starts September 21st. So soon? Yeah. And where is it? Uh, John Godin got it into Argenta. It's in Argenta. And if you want to find out about it or sign up for it, how do you do it? Well, it's a juried... Um, what does that mean? Well, it means it's for... People who are not in school, they're out of school and they're working in their whatever their discipline is and they submit their work and then they have people because there's only room for 25. Um, is it full already? Artists. It is. Mm -hmm. Oh, so no one but, but it'll that. come around again. Next and, year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, either next year. I, I don't, they might be doing it every two years. And no, what are you going to teach? I don't really, t I'm a facilitator. So there's 25 artists and there's five facilitators. So the first year it's set up. The first uh, hour of the three hours is uh, everyone in the room, and we're kind of going over whatever that subject is. The second hour, uh, each week will have a theme. So let's say it's taxes and finances and things you need to know as an artist. Oh, wow. Then maybe a CPA will come in and talk about what you need to know. And um, then the third hour, we go to small groups of the five artists <clears throat> and one facilitator. And we keep the same small group throughout the eight weeks. And so then we go over just real quickly, you know, your, your personal life, your finances and um, your art life, because they all affect one another. And so we just kind of go around. And so you build this trust between the six of us and we talk about uh, artist statements or resumes and we, we just critique each other and go over everything. So I'm just as much in there as anything. I'm not. So you're not really creating art. No, we're creating a life. In that's the right. Yeah. Wow. That's really different. You're creating a life in the arts. Mm -hmm. But this is coming under the umbrella of the Mid-America Arts Alliance, which is under the National Endowment for the Arts. And they've kind of set up the curriculum that we're sort of going off of. I'm so, I'm so impressed with that. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Because I think a lot of artists just don't want to deal with all that. No, well, and that's, I mean, okay, that's a whole other subject because you do. You get all these different personalities. I have a real good friend who's a painter. He's in his 70s, and I sort of talk about like like it's a restaurant. You know, you have somebody who's maybe on the sidewalk saying, hey, blah, blah, you know, really out there bringing them in or the maitre d' or whatever or, or as a waiter. Or you have the people in the kitchen who don't even really want to be <laughs> maybe around the people. And he's sort of like that. He doesn't want to. He hates openings. He hates the shows. He doesn't care for that part of it. So he wants the gallery to just sort of take care of the things and, and do it. And um, like I said, I have to get out and the nature of my beast is to sell it. You know, so I've, it's not my nature, but I've had to. You have develop had to, that part. That's right. You have to learn to sell it. I think that the most successful artists that I know are ones that know how to sell. It's it's easier for me to sell your product than it is. And I think for most artists than to sell themselves, and that's it's very personal. Yeah, because it's it's Rejection. also. 
the rejection, yeah, <laughs> the rejection aspect of it. Yeah, the whole psychological part of it, uh, plus any tainting of this is art. It should be pure. And now I'm trying to monetize it. You know, you, you get into a lot of the of that psychology part of it that that can really muck the waters up. Yeah, I can imagine. That's well said. How long did it take you before you start being able to live on your art? Mm, well, the kids, the twins are 18, and they've just gone off, so 19, 19 20 years or so. Not, you've been doing it for 19 or 20 years, but how long before you were able, before it started? Like, it took Flag and Banner nine years before it could support me, so how long do you oh, think? Oh, well, I mean, good Lord. I mean, I kind of jumped the, the, the job job in 80, started in 89, and then uh, the twins were born in 99, 98, so, yeah, so... Nine, nine or ten years or something like that. Did it start to really take off? Yeah, I mean, That's take funny. off is a relative term, but yeah. I mean, it's it's been what's your a roller next, coaster. What's your yeah. next one? That you're, what are you working on now? Well, actually, the, after the after the General Darby, I got a call from a veterinarian in Fort Benning, Georgia, and he, they want to do a memorial to the canines that go in first, and um, so I'm doing um, this large dog attack dog. And he was funny, too, because he goes, yeah, I'm going to fly you down here and get you in a flight suit. And I said, I'm sorry, flight suit? And he goes, no, bite suit. Oh. And that's when I was, that's okay, buddy. I'm not, as I said, I'm not, a, I'm not really a method sculptor. I don't need to be attacked and chewed up to, to, be, to be able to. I don't know. You sound like a method sculptor to me. You kind of get into all these people. So are you going to do the dog? I am. I, ha I have it. I, I've got, he's already been enlarged. He's And you just right did uh, uh, something from Mount St. Mary's. Yeah, and I brought that to them this morning. What was it? Uh, a crucifix for their chapel, seven seven feet tall. That's just incredible. So let's don't forget, Levon Helms needs to get bronze. So you so we we'll go to the Tim. What is it? We're going go go, to go look up just Levon Helm Memorial GoFundMe. And if you want to get in, if you want to get in to buy some of your work, Kevin, where do they go? Ah, uh, you know, for years and years and years, I was at Gallery Twenty Six, but I'm not really producing work like that anymore. you're not doing you're not doing uh paintings anymore are you you're just doing sculptures i'm lucky to get one yeah so it'd be worth even more when i kick the bucket so <laughs> i think i'll be gone before you are <laughs> so uh so you, your work like you're just doing commissioned work your work like that's yeah well I, now i do have a studio that I've, I've got this past year out at the what used to be the saint joseph's orphanage so, because oh, before yeah. then, I was really um, working at Martin Burkett Building Supplies in a warehouse space when I was doing the large pieces. So, uh, so you're at St. Joseph's. Joseph's Orphanage in North Little Rock, and you show there a little bit? Uh, we, occasionally, well, they'll do it. Yeah, we'll do a little show or something. But I'm, I'm, I'm actually starting um, a kind of a series of portraits of the same person, and I do a charcoal and an oil and a bust. So I'd love to eventually have a show of about if i got maybe six or eight models worth of work uh to where you would see the same model in three different mediums by the same artist and just see how the different mediums affect uh what you're picking up from the person from the model the person who's modeling that sounds really interesting well, i hope so okay uh, <laughs> if someone wants to commission you how do they get in touch with you oh go to kevincressy.com and then they can contact me yeah nobody's there. got that name Kevin Cressy, K R E S S E. K R E S S E. Nobody's got that name. So look yes. what I gave you. Thank you so much for coming on. I always love visiting with you. you ah, in an Italy flag. An Italy flag, because you changed we your life in Italy. Year, well, yes, it did. And we spent a year I in Italy. I thought Bridget might like that. I love it. Thank you so much. That's the Arkansas flag, the U.S. flag, and an Italy flag, because Italy changed your life. It did. Kevin, you are one in a million. Oh, baby, back at you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> Tim, Tim, who do we have on next week? Lawyer Gary Green. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. That ought to be great. Uh, to my listeners, if you have a great entrepreneurial story you would like to share, I would love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info to questions, questions. Oh, oh. at upyourbusiness.org. <laughs> almost, almost, oh, almost stepped on your word. Sorry. <laughs> and someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program has been about you, you're right. But it's also been for me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. <laughs>
been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. If you'd like to hear this program again, next week go to flagandbanner.com, click the tab labeled radio show, and there you'll find a podcast with links to resources you heard this